My guest for this evening is Dana Bond, and I will introduce her and ask her to tell me a little bit about her family. Welcome, Dana. Thank you for having me. Tell me about Dana's family. I know that you have little girls. You got a husband. You got little girls. Tell me about your family. Um, I do have a little little girls. I actually have three girls. Um, I have a fourteen-year-old, and then I have a four-year-old and a now three-year-old all girls. My husband is the oldest of four boys and all he has is girls in his house. Um, my husband and I have been married for almost six years. Um, I, he is a pastor son, which I never in a million years imagined that I would be married to. Um, but that is, that's our family. We're surrounded by a wonderful community um, in a great a congregation and I have a bunch of loving and caring friends that are really our family here in the Northeast Houston area. Were you raised in the Houston area? No, I was actually raised um, on South Padre Island in the far tip of Texas. When you were just a teeny little girl, uh, you were influenced by mom and by dad and by things around you, but by the time you moved from little on to teenage years, there were things within your life that brought you to the brink of different thinking as a teen. What were those things that happened, Dana? Well, a few things. Um, my, I, my sister and I didn't have a ton of supervision growing up, so we supervised ourselves. And um, one thing led to another. It, I became sexually active uh, probably at the age of 13. Um, and of your own choice? Of my own choice. No one forced me to do anything. It was more of me searching for love and finding, trying to find love. Um, I became pregnant at the age of 14. And um, at that time, my parents' decision was for me to um, abort the pregnancy. Uh, after that, I had no after abortive care, no therapy, no one to really talk to about it. So I turned all of that grief that I was feeling into needing more things to kind of kill the grief. So it was um, alcohol at a very young age, drug addiction, more sexual partners, um, which led me to about the age of 17 being a drop out of high school, um, homeless, living in the back of a station wagon, um, having uh, sex for a place to live, for drugs, and then venturing into um, the realm of prostitution until I hit my bottom at that point and um, went to my mother one afternoon after I was told I was either going to do a line of cocaine with these people that I thought were my friends who loved me or I was going to get out because they didn't care about what my feelings were. Um, so I went to her one afternoon and said, can you move me to North Texas to live with my grandmother? Because I just can't take so, it so, so you found something, a conscience-bound idea that said to you, where I'm going and what I'm doing probably is going to self-destruct me. Right. And so your decision was, all on your own, uh, that I'm going to go visit with Grandma. Tell me about Grandma. Uh, my grandmother, my Mimi, it was my sole connection at the time to Jesus and to the gospel. She, um, whenever I was younger, would take me to church. She, um, she was just my role model. She didn't at the time, I don't think she believed or understood what kind of situation I was in whenever I came back. She learned it over the years as I got older some of the things that I had been through, but um, she just loved on me really well and took me to church and pretty much I hung out with um, her 70-year-old girlfriends and were just loved on a whole lot during that time. So. so Grandma was really a stable thing for you in terms of, of where you were. Uh, Grandma didn't know of initially what the issues were, did she? No. And she didn't ask questions like, well, Dana, what's wrong with you, and how come this, and how come that? She didn't ask that. No. I, I, she probably sensed some things. She raised three daughters of her own, and um, so she probably sensed that there was a reason why I came back up. But it wasn't her place to ever 
judge me. Um, she was my safe place. I never felt judgment of her um, through all of my growing up. So she just showed me love and compassion. And was it was it this thing that she had done for you as a little girl that's introducing you to this Jesus thing that just hung in your heart? to think maybe this might be one of the answers that I need? I believe so. I think that even at a young age, um, her taking me to church, I always felt like I was supposed to be in some form of ministry, even whenever I was in the depths of drug addiction and alcohol. I always knew that I was meant for something more. There was like this little eating in me that there was something more than this. So I think that was a lot of her actually taking me in um, to church and introducing me to uh, not only churches like the building, but just what Jesus was through her actions. There's a wonderful thing that God has created within all of us. It's a thing called a conscience. And um, the conscience bears witness to the law of God inscribed on our heart, even while we're not thinking about it. So deep within the recesses of your mind and heart was that conviction, this ain't right. Um, there's got to be something within this that's going to pre create for me an escape into something different. Right. And what Grandma did was really a blessing for you, even though you look back upon it now and you, you did not know then what you know now about what she had done. It was kind of a God thing that yes. in a simple <laughs> loving way, she introduced you to people uh, that were God fearing people so that you saw a different vision of that. Mm -hmm. What vision did you have of your friends when you were a teen or to your, your young adulthood? Were they influential in your life? Did they mean anything to you or are they just people to hang out with? They were hugely influential. Um, I, I went after and sought after the feeling to be loved and to be included. And so I was very much a follower of the pact and what they wanted to do, um, and which led me into situations where I did go into prostitution because somebody else thought it would be a good idea to do. And I was very easily, manip not manipulated, but very easily swayed into that process because I was always a people pleaser from a young age. Uh, so. so therein lies a big issue for you as a people pleaser. Uh, it was difficult to stand up for yourself once in a while, and even so, your conscience was pretty at what you were doing. You were still, as a people pleaser, to go past that. Right. You're in your young adulthood, and things are going south real quick. And you're recognizing that this is not the path. Uh, were you still living with grandmother at the time? Um, I lived with her my my first part of my senior year in high school, I went, whenever I went back up to North Texas, I enrolled myself or my mother, enrolled me to high school, and I wound up finishing on time, um, so I didn't get held back or anything. It, but the pattern of needing to be loved was still constant, so it was still like a revolving door of um, male relationships that I constantly thought, oh, this is going to be the one, this is going to be my forever, and that would fall apart, and then another one, and another one, until my early 20s, um, I was 23, and found myself pregnant, um, and unmarried, um, and I now have a 14-year-old daughter from that relationship, or that um, interaction, but, and that was a little bit of awakening, it was one of those, okay, this, I, I've done this again, here I am pregnant again. Uh, but at that time, there was something in me that was just a lot stronger in the fact that I was, I, that was my child and I was going to keep that child and um, I was just a much stronger person in that. Describe that stronger person. That, that's really interesting that you recognize that as, as an issue. Describe that stronger person to me that was inside somewhere. Um, I think that I had gotten past the point of kind of getting beat upon, not actually physically beat upon, but letting other people do things to me. I had become very much, um, I am woman, hear me roar. 
and I was I did not want to go through what I went through before in aborting a child because it dramatically changed me. I, it was heartbreaking and it was something that I lived with every single day. And I knew whenever I got pregnant with my daughter that I didn't care what was offered to me, what, um, what wonderful, bright outcome people said that I would have, that I would be able to finish college if I didn't have her, that I would get all, you know, all these things would be so much better if I didn't have my daughter. I was like, I'm, ha I'm having her and this is what I'm doing. And it was one of the best decisions of my life to have that child. Let so. me go back to that, uh, that abortion time. It's a cruel time to think about. But you know something? There's somebody who's listening somewhere in the listening audience now and throughout the week who really is struggling with that. Mm -hmm. You struggled with it one time, and between that time and your 22nd year, things changed. Help that young lady, whoever she is and wherever she may be, to see what you saw to make a difference. To make, to have the, to make the decision to yes. keep my child. Uh, well, and I, my story goes on a little bit, just to give you a little bit more as far as abortion and what abortion has done to my life. I hit bottom in my mid thirties, uh, pretty badly after being in an abusive marriage, uh, and found myself in a relationship with a man who had a full blown methamphetamine habit, um, and found myself pregnant then, but felt trapped and lost and thinking there's no way I could be a single parent again. And at that point in my life, believed the lies again that I did whenever I was younger, and I wound up um, aborting that pregnancy as well. In both of those, what I tell people over and over again is you can't believe the lies that you're told. You can't believe the lies that the devil tells you. You can't believe the lies that you're told in the media that once you're done with that process and once you leave that clinic and once you walk across the sidewalk, you know, and get past the people who are there to tell you not to have an abortion. Once you get past them, that's not the end of your road. It will eat at you every day, every year afterwards. To some people, it takes, you know, 10 years for that to kick in and the grief to set in as to what you have done and that child. It really took me till the birth of our youngest daughter, who's very small and we had a hard pregnancy and we almost lost her and I there's something about her little soul that made my past two abortions hit me dramatically to where I needed to go and speak to someone about them but it's it will always be there that it's not an out um, it doesn't solve it doesn't solve your problems having, going through the procedure and um, terminating the pregnancy. Let's go back to that question. Help that lady, help that young woman, help that mother who has had a child or two. And she says, at this point, I can't afford it. I can't, I can't, whatever. And I will have this aborted. Talk to her heart. I, and I can't because I was in the same place, especially the second time around. And there is help everywhere you just have to ask for it um, and you have to let go of that pride that you know you are strong enough to have children on your own especially if you are in a situation where you're a single parent you are strong enough to raise those children that you currently have and if you're that strong you're strong enough to ask for help and there is help I thought at the time because I was middle class upper middle class background that there was not help for me and there is help not only i mean you need someone to come alongside you and be like not only can you do it financially you you can do this mentally i mean there's you've got to rely on you know on god there's a lot of prayer um in that but it can be done and I, it's just worth, if I could do things over again, it's worth 
getting past your fear of the what ifs of having that child is so much, it's worth it compared to the life and what you live post-abortive and getting past being post-abortive. I'm currently in the stages of healing. Um, so, but it's taken me years. I mean, my first, I was 14 whenever I first aborted a child. It, it took me, I lived in secrecy for years. My family didn't learn about either of my abortions until a year ago. So. The braveness that you have is not artificial. The braveness that you have to talk about this is real. Mm -hmm. Artificial braveness would uh, create more lies, more excuses, but real bravery says, I need to talk about this, not to flesh this, uh, flesh this out of my soul, but because I know there, is, uh, there are answers that are better. Right. And I, I fought um, that feeling for years, and finally God released my grip on his own by releasing little secrets of my life along the way. Uh, to where I had to fill my family in on all the details, but I have such a freer life in telling my story and getting the secrets out. And the women who I have helped just this far, the you know, in all the stages of my story, because I've got different pieces and I have different women um, in each part. I have women who can relate to each thing. And I tell people over and over again, I don't think that we will get, I don't think that we can get healed fully unless we share our story and let other people come in and comfort us. And I mean, the day that I sat in the living room of my father-in-law, who's a pastor's home, and told him who I swore would be one of, I, not that he would, he's a wonderful man, but I just knew, the devil told me that it would be over. The devil told me my marriage was going to be over if I let my family know that I had had abortion. It was just going to be over. But the love that I felt from him in that moment whenever he reached over and he just said, but I love you. And I think I love you more than I did. Same with my husband. It's like, I think I love you more than I did five minutes ago because you were able to share that. Honesty caused by the forgiveness of sins, mm -hmm. creates um, something so pure and so holy that you can talk about it and someone else will not hold you accountable for it anymore. Isn't that wonderful? Not only will I forgive you your sin, the Lord says, I will remember it no more. You know, he says, David, it's all gone. It's history. I'll never bring it back to you again. But you've said it. You've been forgiven. Talk a little bit uh, about that that whole issue of being set free, what that looks like. Well, it takes a little while, uh, or it did for me, uh, and what I had to do in order for me to be set free is believe that God loves me um, and loves me no matter what. I always put parameters on it. I knew that I was going to get to heaven and he was going to go through a checklist and be like, okay, yes, you know, you did this, so oh, that's okay, that's okay. And he would get to a certain part of my story, and he would go, oh, but wait a minute, you did these things. There's another line for you. You know, you're going to go over here. And it's giving up. We've got lines for people like you. Yeah. Right, there's there's another section for you all. <laughs> um, it's giving that up and believing 110% that he let, and he knows more about me than anyone does. I mean, he knows the stuff that I don't let people know yet. And he still loves me 110%. So, so Jesus became real to you, I mean, really real to you, uh, when you were about 20, 25, somewhere in there? I mean, that transformation of heart and mind took place somewhere in there? Yes, I, I, I believe in my late teens, early 20s, whenever I moved up to North Texas, I pulled a whole lot from Jesus and found myself praying in my, um, and it continued as things developed through my 20s. My 20s were not great at all. Um, and yeah, I kept going back 
to, I would stray and then I would come back and I'd stray and I would come back. And, um, till finally he had his way with me one Valentine's day where I'm like, I'm not going to go out. I'm not going to meet a guy, no dates. I'm just going to sit at home by myself. And I just prayed and, you know, just worked through things on my own. And I learned that if I, that I needed to love myself before I was healthy enough to love anyone else. So what a story. Uh, it's a story of, of spiritual change and heart and mind. It's a story of, uh, I never want to go back, but I'm going to go forward because I know that someone's got me by the hand and that's Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's so precious because of the fact that, that people who have heard your story are struggling with that movement forward. Right. And I would like to say, Dana, that this has been a, an incredible time. We only have a few seconds left to, left in the in the thirty minutes. But what I want to tell you, I want to thank you for being willing to tell your story and let others others, especially women who are walking in the same path, uh, let them say, "There is hope for me as well." The hope that comes first of all from the knowledge of Jesus, where there is forgiveness, there is true hope. Yes. Thank you, Jesus, for giving Dana the hope that she's got. May your name be blessed by all that we say or do. 